We've been going through Revelation, uh, John on the island of Patmos, banished by the Roman Caesar. Um, by the way, you didn't film any of that country music singing. Okay, good girl. Um, John receives a revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus appears to him and Jesus, you know, he falls down like he was dead at his feet. Jesus said, don't be afraid. He's got something for him. And he tells him, hey, look, write down what you've seen. Jesus in his glorified state. White hair, eyes like fire, feet as burnished brass, you know. Seven stars in his hand, white robe, gold sash. Write down the things which you have seen. Write down the things which are. Things which you have seen is chapter 1. The things which are were the church age. John was the... Was the you know, the patriarch of the church, the last living apostle at the time who had been with Jesus. He was an old man. They tried to kill him. It didn't work. They banished him to an island. And, he's, and Jesus has got a message to the seven churches in, in, in Asia, which was modern, which today is modern day Turkey. There were seven literal churches. Um, and the things that will take place after that, after what? After the church age, after the church is dealt with, and the things that come after. So, so we're in the middle of the church age, these seven churches we've been studying church by church. Now, John, as he writes these things, is writing prophetically. It's a dual, it's a dual purpose revelation that Jesus has given him. Hey, it, it is for seven churches that were located on a Roman postal route. Each one had, had some um, positive affirmation that Jesus said, wow, you're doing this good and corrective exhortation, but I got this against you. Except for uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia, there's no um, um, uh, corrective exhortation. Those two churches are okay, but the rest of them, hey, you're doing good here, but you got a problem here. You need to get it together. Here's what's good. Here's what's not good. And we look at that on these churches. We see them as seven, also seven types of churches and also how we can be as Christians and what God approves and what he doesn't approve, what he likes and what he doesn't like. But we also see them as seven periods in church history because looking back now over 2,000 years, we can identify things through church history that took place in this sequence and it's the same sequence of what Jesus is saying to these churches as well. So we've been looking at that. We looked at the marrying of the church into the state when Constantine came in and he, he declared religious tolerance. He said, we'll tolerate the edict of tolerance. We're going to tolerate Christians. No more persecuting them. They're, they're allowed to worship like everyone else. And then Rome adopted it as its state religion. Now we are all Christians and it was imposed and we saw the pagan roots stem into the church in a wild way. Things that were never in the church all of a sudden got into the church pagan things from pagan temp temples and pagan worship and are still in some of the churches today. And then we looked at uh, last week Thyatira, that period roughly from about uh, 600 AD to when they put their first man over the church and, and the first pope over the church all the way up to about 1500 AD um, where the people begin to protest for reform and that's where we get the Protestant Reformation that we'll be looking at today. But at the time there was only one church. One church. And that church uh, began uh, with the apostles. The headquarters eventually get switched to Rome. There's the Marian and there's still one church. It's, it's known that last period of time is the Dark Ages. Some, some horrendous things took place. And also, they, they squashed down science, art, music. They don't want any of that during the time. And, and, and uh, the one church that had been in power, that, is in, that was in power during this time span, is only one that was called Catholic, which means universal. And it was a dark period for that church as well. And we went into great detail last week. And we talked about that the, there were godly people in that movement. Every movement, there's godly remnant in there doing, trying to do good things. This week is no different. At one time there was one church, but this week we're going to see the breaking out and the expansion into many different Christian churches from one uh, and into what's called denominations. This is where we get denominations from. Denominations simply means identifying by a name or a group. So if you're at a bank and they, they tell you, take this money, separate it into denominations. Well, here's all the ones, here's all the fives, the tens, the twenties, the fifties, the hundreds different denominations that identify them and by, by who they are and what they believe. 
that you're a Methodist, I'm Episcopal. Um, a mainline denomination is a larger group that's been around and established for years, such as Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopal, Baptist, Assembly of God, etc. Usually run by a central figure or a central office or a headquarters or a president and dictates where the churches can be, how they're going to teach, what they're going to teach, etc., etc. So there's a hierarchy and a structure in there. Um, um, the church in Sardis that we're looking at today is a shift away from a single church to a fragmented church where you have the beginnings of denominational Christianity. The church in Sardis represents the time from about 1500, 1400 to about 1700 AD in church history. And we're going to look at that. So let's read Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, and get into the Word of God. It says this, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. There's your partial description of Jesus from chapter 1. Each church gets a partial description of Jesus. Um, I know your works. That you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your word. For in it we find truth and life, Lord. And we pray, Father, that we don't come, a, come here today out of a routine or a ritual, but out of a desire to know you. That we might know the truth, and the truth might set us free. That we might rightly divide your word this day. That we are blessed to have the freedom to have the word in our own language, at our fingertips, that we can study it whenever we want. And Lord, I would ask once again that you use me today as a tool, Father. Lord, not my words going forth, Lord, but via the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, your words flowing through me. We love you, Father, and we praise you, and we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Like all groups we talked about, like all churches we talk about, Jesus says there's a faithful remnant within there. Every church has the faithful remnant. Every church has people who have not given up the faith, who are holding on and trying to fight uh, to, to make things right. The Catholic Church had great, great people and great popes, people who were trying to correct and make things right. These churches as well have these same things. There's a group and a remnant in there that haven't defiled their garment, haven't gone after pagan ways or worldly ways, and he's going to clothe them in white. The person who overcomes will be clothed in, in white. But here's what he says, I won't blot his name out of the book of life, which is interesting, which means you can be blotted out. The other thing that's interesting is that he says, oh, but I will confess his name before my father and the angel. Remember what Jesus said? He said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father which is in heaven. And we talked about that, that we can deny God. We can say we're Christians all we want. We can say I'm a Christian. I'm, I can go to the, the Starbucks Bible study every Tuesday. I can go to the worship night, go to church, hold up my Bible, have the Christian fish on my car, but I can deny Jesus by my actions. Just wearing the title doesn't mean anything, but I can deny him by my lifestyle. I can deny him by what I do. And you see what Jesus says again and again is, I know your works. He sees everything we do. We can't fool him, you know. And he says... If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. If you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. But if we love him and hold on to him, he will profess us before his Father and the angels in heaven. I would never want Jesus to be ashamed of me, amen? I would never want him to deny me, amen? That's some heavy stuff. First, Sardis is another city of important wealth, was the capital of the Lydian Empire for a while. 
a place where they dyed wool, made garments, a place that was an important city in crossroads and trade. The Greeks conquered it, the Romans conquered it, still in uh, Turkey today. It's got a lot of artifacts there uh, um, uh, from the ancient days where Christians, Christian uh, things, uh, Jewish things, crusaders, uh, when the Crusaders were coming from the Middle East down there. The interesting thing about the Crusaders when you visit these, these sites here is the Crusaders were like graffiti guys. So if they didn't do it with spray paint, they did it with chisels. And they would chisel crosses all over the place, over pagan things. You know, you see some Greek inscription or Latin inscription from the Romans. And they would chisel in Christian icons and stuff, man. And uh, those things are still around in these cities. But this city is pretty much uh, kind of in ruins. Really not a modern city anymore. Uh, but this is the city they're talking about. So Jesus gives a partial description of himself found in chapter 1. Every one of the churches gets a partial description of Jesus. Now, we see that that in, in no church uh, does Jesus give his whole description. That means we are the body of Christ and together we complete the picture of Jesus. Whether you like the guy down the block or not, whether you like the denomination or not, whether you like the charismatic movement or not, whether you like the conservative or the Bible Baptist or whatever or not, we're connected in the body of Christ. You may be different, but only together do we get a complete picture of Jesus. And the same in a church. We may have many different people in the body, but some people may display different aspects of the Lord, and together we get a complete picture of, of Jesus Christ. So this particular description that he gives is interesting because it's he who has the seven spirits and holds the seven stars. We know the seven stars are the seven angelos, angels or messengers or pastors of each one of these churches, but... But, what are the seven spirits of God? And where is that mentioned before? We don't know too much about it, but we do find it in Isaiah um, chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, speaking about Jesus as being the offshoot or the branch of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. God spoke to David and told him that, you know, his, uh, out of him would become that seed or, or the, the throne of David would not go unseated. In other words, the future Messiah would, would come. Uh, from his line. And we see Jesus comes from the line of David. But it says this in uh, Isaiah 11 chapter 1. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. David's dad through David. And it says this. It lists seven spirits. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is the spirit that will be upon Jesus. The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, what does all that mean? What is the purpose? I have no idea because the Bible doesn't say what it is. Amen? It just lists that. So we know that on this root out of Jesse, on Jesus, the spirit would rest. And here he is now in heaven saying, with whom is the seven spirits? So that's where we get that from. That's where we look at and and. Uh, the spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord will be upon Jesus. And certainly they were. But here's what Jesus says. He says, I know your deeds. And listen. He says, you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. You have a name. I like what the NIV translated. The NIV says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. It's not real what you got. It's interesting. This is not a good thing. There's an outward appearance, so people are thinking you're a Christian, but you're not, and you can't fool Jesus. And this is what Jesus was chasing the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day, and calling them hypocrites and brood of vipers, and saying, on the outside, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside. You go through the motions. You say the right things. You do the right things. But inside you're black. You're dead. You're darkness inside. And we can never fool Jesus. He says, I know your deeds. He knows everything we do. We can't fool him. And, and he knows this. Remember what's said in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 22. And this is about going through the motions. This is about playing the game here. Here's what Jesus said. 
He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many things in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Why? Because they were just using Jesus' name. They were just using his name. They weren't loving him as Lord. They weren't living their faith. They were just throwing the name out. You remember the seven sons of Sceva in, in, the, in the book of Acts? These guys were trying to cast out demons and they came to this guy who was demon possessed and they said, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, get out. And the demon answered him and said, Jesus I know. Paul I know, but who are you? And what did he do? He beat him up and they ran out of the house naked and beaten. You know, it's not just enough to have the name. It's not just enough to wear the little fish symbol. To go to the Starbucks coffee Bible study, get your frappa latte chino, sit with the guys or the girls and sip and, and have a little Christian social hour. It's not enough to speak Christianese or go to a Bible study and go to church and raise your hand and all that stuff. That, that, that superficial stuff, if, if, if it's not real in the heart. You see, that's what God's looking at. He's looking for the heart. He's looking for the truth of our faith. That we love him. And if we love him we'll obey him. You know. And that's where obedience is tough. You see. I can be very disciplined and very obedient. If Kat is like my ruler right. And she says. Tom get over here. Yes Kat. I want you to get in that kitchen and eat all the pizza you can eat right now. <sighs> okay Kat. And I go mop up a bunch of pizza. And oh man, you don't know how obedient I am. Cat tells me to do something. I go do it. It's easy when I'm doing something I like, amen. That's what Cat tells me. You better get in there and eat all that sashimi right now. You better take one for the team, man. I had to do that in Japan, you know. I was stuck. They left me alone at this house with all these Japanese guys, right? And, and, and like everybody else, for some reason, got to go to the next house. And I was stuck there with all these guys, right? And a lady wanted to bless us, so she dropped this big cash and she made this meal. And she gave us some sort of soup. And then she gave us inside the soup half of an entire crab, okay? With the little legs hanging out and the body over here. And, and like seven pieces of sashimi. Which I don't eat, amen? Never. And they were sucking the guts out of this body. You know, like it was caramel popcorn or something, man. And they were like, whoa. And they were all looking at me. Let's see how the howly guy gets out of this one. <laughs> and I had to take one for the team, man. Because I was the only Christian guy there, right? I drank about 50 gallons of water. I didn't even chew the sashimi. I put it on my tongue. I took a glass of water. Boom! Right down, man. Took one, put it on my tongue, boom, seven times, man. And I don't even want to get into the crab, okay? If you love me, you'll obey my commands no matter how hard it is, amen? See, that's a real faith. Chris Burkhart, you don't know. Dang. Just messes me up thinking about that, amen? Jesus said, be watchful and stay awake. Don't fall asleep on the job. Don't fall asleep on your faith. That's what Peter warned us about in 1 Peter 5.8. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Don't fall asleep on a job. Why? Because you're going to get killed. Someone is going to get killed. Something bad is going to happen because the enemy is waiting for you to slip up. Now, during the wars, Vietnam, World War II, uh, a crazy thing would take place where guys would be very fatigued and they would tell them stay awake, stay alert, you're on guard and you're in a foxhole and you're, 
you're looking this way and anything moves there. But guys would fall asleep. And they would have guys that would slink up to this foxhole and they would kill the guy. So sometimes they would kill one guy. There would be two guys sleeping. They'd come up, they'd slit the guy's throat. The guy would die. Now when the other guy woke up, now when the other guy woke up, he would see his buddy dead. Psychologically would just mess him up to no end, let alone a buddy got killed. Or they would sleep and the enemy would attack and they weren't prepared. So we're to be vigilant because we have an enemy who's trying to pounce on us. There's a warning. Jesus is saying, wake up. Why? Because they've fallen asleep. They've fallen asleep to the wiles and the, and, and the, the um, uh, tests of the enemy, his tactics. He says this, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. He's saying you got a reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. You've fallen asleep. He's calling them to wake up and get back in the game and strengthen what is left in the church because it too is about to die. you got a little ember left and it's about to burn out. Truly the Protestant Reformation was a fire sparked on by a need and a desire to get back to the root of God, to get back to God's Word, to get the Word back to God's people. And it went off like wildfire and then it fizzled out. And the things they protested against, the things that they fought so hard against to get away from, they eventually became. They were struggling so hard to get out of this one church that had dominion and power and rule with a heavy fist over the people. And then they started their own little organizations and structures and things like that. The apples didn't fall far from the tree. Around 1300, the Catholic Church, in a dark period of their time, was in control and ruled with that iron fist. It was a very corrupt stage in their existence. There were people and popes who tried to keep the faith and correct the course, but it wasn't enough. It didn't. The power was already set. They were setting up kings and kingdoms, like we talked about, placing people in authority. In about 1300 AD, it was the educated people of Europe who could read Latin, who could read the Bible as it was, and beginning to call for reform. Now listen, you had the masses of people. The majority of people were illiterate. If they could read and write, it was in their language. At this time, the Roman Empire is far gone. You have England, you have Norway, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, etc., etc., all with their own languages, all being ruled. And the Catholic Church said, nope, the Bible is in Latin. Remember what we talked about last week when we looked at Jezebel. And Jezebel killed what? All the prophets of God. The prophets of God what? They speak the word of God. If you can kill the word of God, you can rule the people. If you can take the word of God away from the people, you can say whatever you want. That's why you cannot ever give up the word of God. That's why we're ultimately blessed in America because we have the Bible everywhere. You got it on your cell phone. You got it in different languages. You got about 10 copies at home. It's all over the place. You have the Word. And we have to be like the Bereans who listened to Paul, heard what he had to say, went back to the Scriptures to check to see if what he said was correct. Because you can't just believe me. I have to prove myself via the Word, that I'm a teacher of God's Word. And you got to know God's Word and say, yeah, that is correct. Yeah, that is right. So the Catholic Church, at that time in their history, was not really teaching the Word, but they were teaching Roman Catholic doctrine. They had the Bible chained to the pulpit. If you could get a copy of it, you had to read it in Latin. And the only way you could read it in Latin is to be a scholar or an educated person. So these educated people started saying, we need the language in the common men so they can get the Word of God as well. The educated people began to speak out against the corruptness and the ungodliness and basically called sin, sin, and said the church is in sin because we can read the Word and the Word says this and you're doing that. And you're saying this and that's not in the Word. And the Catholic Church hammered down because they had rule and authority and power. It was a very bad time. Around this time, the four, 
of the forerunner of the Protestant Reformation publicly takes on the Vatican. It's a guy named John Wycliffe. He was a bright man who was a teacher at Oxford University. He understood the Word of God. He read the Word of God. He challenged the church on things like their dominion over the people, their priests and officers' domination and rule over the people, non-scriptural doctrine, the Pope's authority. He fought the Bible to get in the language of the common people, and he was the first guy to translate the Bible into the English language. You still can find this. It's called the Wycliffe Bible. He was a bright man. The church deemed Wycliffe as a heretic, and a stiff-necked heretic at that, and they tried to burn him at the stake, but before they could get him, he died. So instead of burning him at the stake, after he died, they went and digged up his bones, and then they burned his bones anyway. Just to show the people, you know. So they burned his bones as well, but it was kind of too late. Next came a guy named Jan Hus, or John Hus, around the 1400s, another university professor at the University of Prague. Same situation. Read the word, saw the discrepancies, began to call out against these discrepancies, wanted to, uh, saw the uh, Wycliffe's translation, wanted his own. He called for change. He questioned the Catholic Church, began to influence Middle Europe like Wycliffe did. He had a strong influence on Martin Luther. The Catholic Church declared him as a heretic as well, excommunicated him, and launched five holy wars against him and his followers. It's called the Husselite Wars. You can look it up. And they won five times, these guys. Finally, they did catch up with him, and they burned him at the stake as a heretic, as a, as a lesson for everything else. This guy was a Christian guy. Like I said last week, now the church is going from being persecuted to the persecutor. And they begin to burn other Christians at the stake because they want the Bible. And they want what's in the Bible and they want it correctly. And this is what begins to happen all over the place. Um, men like Erasmus rise up, question many things. The Anabaptists, although they were not all in agreement in various aspects of their faith, they began to challenge the authority. Then 1500 comes along and Martin Luther comes on the scene. Very influenced by Huss and these other guys. His dad wants him to be a lawyer. So he goes to school and he becomes a lawyer, but he doesn't want to be a lawyer. So he decides to be a monk and he goes to theological school seminary and he gets a doctorate in the theology. And then he too begins to read it in the, uh, the Bible and he says the people need the word in German. And he sets out about translating the word of God as well. He too is a heretic. Um, he begins to do in-depth studies, um, expositional studies on books like Galatians, Romans, Hebrews, Psalms, and begins to write commentaries on these books to get them out to the people so that they can know as well. He becomes very popular. He wanted the Bible in the common language of the Germans. He did it. King James saw that as well later on. That's how King James comes about. Uh, one of the reasons. But he read something in the book of Romans that changed, radically changed him and radically set a fire on him and the rest of Europe. And that was that salvation doesn't come through the dictation of the church. It comes through Jesus Christ by grace. And here's what he read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Everyone. The Pope, the Virgin Mary, and everybody else. And fall short of the glory of God. Being justified or being made right before God. That's what justification is. What are you doing here? What justifies you to come in my house at 3 o'clock in the morning and eat my Cheerios? Well, your wife said I could do it. Okay, well, you're justified. Well, what justifies you to stand before God as righteous and holy? What Jesus did at the cross. So freely we've been justified. We didn't have to pay for anything. He paid for it. So it says this. It says, being justified freely by what? By his grace. We didn't deserve it, but he gave it to us. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We're saved, we're justified by God's grace, we're saved by faith, and it has nothing to do with the, the church. Going to church don't make you a Christian like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, right? 
right? Well, because it's about this, right? You see, the church would have you believe different at that time. The church would say, we're in control. We say left, right, we say this, that. If you leave the church, you go to hell. Martin Luther said, wait a second. The word of God says, it's by faith we're saved. It's by grace that he did it. It's got nothing to do with you guys. And that set him on a, uh, on a path. Um, he was a student of God's word and began to challenge the teachings and authority of the church and the pulp. He wrote hymns. You know that Martin Luther began to write hymns and encouraged and created congregational worship where we all worship God. How revelatory. It's all through the Bible. Amen. They sung hymns. The, the, the nation of Israel had worshipers and praise leaders who led people in praise. But that wasn't happening. He began to write hymns. He began to encourage the church to worship God. Freaking these guys out. This stuff was mind blowing. But it's biblical. He got married as a priest. Blew him out of the water. But yet he understood Peter had a wife and some of these other guys all had wives. Why now can't we have wives? Unbiblical doctrine. He was breaking down the man-made barriers of the church and the church wasn't happy about it. Now I want you to keep in mind, these guys didn't want to break away from the church. They didn't want to start their own churches. They wanted the church to reform and change and get right. But it wasn't happening. So much so it wasn't happening that the church lashed out and launched out and began to try to kill these people who wanted reform. He saw the church come in. And this is one of the things that really set him, set him on fire. He saw the church come in and sell indulgences. Now the majority of the followers were poor peasant people. You had your rich ruling families and your educated ones. The small group on top. And the masses were uneducated laborers who did not make a lot of money who lived very meagerly in those days in kingdoms the church came in and began to say hey we need some money so we're going to sell indulgences okay so if you want to get one of your friends or family members out of purgatory where that comes from I have no idea purgatory if you want to get Uncle Charlie out of purgatory because you know Uncle Charlie used to hang out down at the pub flirt with the waitresses, do things he shouldn't do and you know he didn't go to church so he's in purgatory so you can go light candles for Uncle Charlie right? And pray him out of purgatory. We're going to do one better for you. If you give us a couple of gold coins we instantly will access our ATM at the Vatican and up in heaven God will get it. He'll send us a receipt. Uncle Charlie will be out of purgatory. Amen? It's just that simple now. We need some money. You give us money and people will automatically be taken out of purgatory into heaven because the church can do this. They have the power now. Ludicrous, crazy, unbelievable stuff. Matter of fact, if you have sinned in the past and it's a horrendous sin and you're worried about whether or not you're forgiven or not, we'll guarantee you're forgiven for that previous sin. You remember that time, Isaac, when you stole the neighbor's milk cow? And you've been living in, in condemnation for that? Because you've never read, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because you don't read the Word of God. And you're carrying this burden, and they call you cow thief, and all that. Here comes Isaac the cow thief. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It was 20 years ago. He was five years old, but he is Isaac the cow thief. For two gold coins, we will make sure that sin is forgiven. Even better is we'll sell pre-forgiveness for sins you're about to do. Oh yeah. So if you want to steal another milk cow, <laughs> or you want to steal the milk cow's owner's wife, just for a few days, ten gold coins, and we'll pre-forgive you of that sin. This is true. This is historical. This is historical and hysterical. So you get a bunch of poor people who are uneducated, who don't know the Word of God, who hear the church as the authority over the people who can't be wrong because they're sinless, and the Pope says so and he's sinless, 
And we need to make some more money so they go out and do this. And these people who are broke get more broke because they got fear and doubt. They're worried about their uncle. They have condemnation in their life. And some of them are just devious and want to do more sin. <laughs> and they get all this money in. And Martin Luther sees this and said, this is just nuts. You guys are nuts. So he comes up with 25 theses or complaints. And he nails them to the door of the Catholic Church. The main one in Germany where he lives. And they go nuts. He's got... 95 accusations against them in regards to the church. They don't like that one bit. Luther's ideas and teachings spread like wildfire throughout Europe. Luther, of course, is excommunicated from the church, but he already has a great following, the German princes, everyone else. Then men like Zwingli in Switzerland, John Calvin in France where you get the Calvinists, John Knox in Scotland where you get the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Reformed Church, Episcopal, they all start popping up attempting to break away from the Roman Church and then persecution begins. They have these holy wars and they have these inquisitions. So maybe Isaac the milk cow thief is trying to break away from the church and Falcon knows about it. We can't find Isaac, but Falcon hangs out with Isaac. So we take Falcon, we put him on the rack, and we call Falcon a heretic. He's like, I'm not a heretic. Yes, you are. So we stretch him out, we begin to torture him. We begin to cut him open and start moving out his intestines in front of him and showing him. We begin to make his life miserable. This is stuff they do. We burn him, we torture him, we cut his tongue out, we do all these things. Then we take Okay, so Falcon, we get Falcon, right? We throw his family out on the street, we burn his house down, and we shun him because we say not only was Falcon a heretic, but so was his family, and because we're all from the church, and when the church is saying they're out of the church, they live a destitute life of poverty because they can't get any help group of uh, believers called the Huguenots in France are breaking away, starting their own, trying to do their own thing. Church comes in and slaughters a thousand of them one shot. They begin to have these wars and begin to have Spanish Inquisition and they begin to torture and go after people and try to kill them all to gain their and maintain their power over the people. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, he calls for reform. He's arrested and burned at the stake as well. Uh, later comes out of that the Church of England, Puritan, Episcopal, Methodist, 1611, King James does get the Bible in, in his own language. But sadly, here's the thing. These Protestants that are breaking away and forming the groups eventually start fighting against each other as well. We're all Calvinists over here, we're all Congregationalists, we're all Puritans over here. And they begin to persecute and kill each other as well. Sad. So you got all this persecution and challenging going on. At the same time, England owns a big piece of land. Well, they claim to own it, called North America. And they need to populate it. They need to populate it so that they can, you know, colonize it and make it one of their little countries part two. They call for people to go to the New World. Who responds to the call? The Christians. Why? Because they want, listen, religious Freedom. They want to be free from this church that's killing and persecuting and having domination over the people. So the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Calvinists, the Puritans, the Quakers, they all go to this new world. Why? Because we can go start a village here and have our own church. And we don't have to worry about this church dominating us or persecuting us. And we don't have to worry about church and state. Because the separation of church and state meant that the church didn't run the state and dictate what religion was going to be. They didn't want, they wanted separation from church and state in that sense. 
He didn't separate the state from the church because the state should have been a Christian state. But they didn't want the church running the state and saying you can only be Catholic, you can only be this. So that's where religious freedom was. Let me tell you what did not happen on the Mayflower. Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Taoists, Shinto priests, and Christians did not get together on a boat and say, okay, we'll go to this country, we can all do our own thing. No. It was a Christian nation. It was Christian freedom to be the denomination or the group that you wanted in Christ and be free to worship Jesus Christ as Lord the way you saw it done. That's what religious freedom is in our nation, was in our nation, is no longer anymore. We were a Christian nation but are not anymore. As the president has said, we're a nation of Muslims, Christians, and Jews. That's not what we were founded on. Listen, out of the Catholic Church they came. They cried out for reform, but the reform was not true reform. The bright light of change, renewal, flickered and fell short. The early teachings and the ideas of getting the people back to the Bible were given way to structure, organization, and rule over the rule of the church over the people. Out of the Catholic Church they came, but the apples didn't fall far from the trees. Rituals, ceremonies, man-made traditions, organizations were implemented as well. 100 years after the breaking away and the reform, many of these great movements and churches become, the, uh, become religious organizations and the denominations that rule over the people, have central offices, have rules, have all the things they tried to get away from, they just recreated them again for themselves. One guy on top, many guys controlling all the people. Many of these churches today have become ultra-liberal. They don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. They don't believe in his atoning death at the cross alone. Heaven or hell, they're split on issues of ordaining and allowing homosexuals to be pastors or in the church. Women as pastors, they don't believe God's word has no error. Uh, they've become very worldly and liberal. They're, they're nothing more than social gatherings. They have the name of Christian church on their signs. They have crosses on their buildings, listings in the phone book. But they're far from anything remotely Christian. Most of these churches are dead in their walk. And the spirit of the living God is no longer evident in them. And you find no difference between them and some other social organization. It's, it's, it's a sad thing. They're dead inside. Um, this is why Jesus is telling them to wake up before it's too late, before he comes again. He's calling them to remember their roots and their desires for the word of God and the love of God, not to be ruled and dominated by men or man's doctrines, but the Bible. And he's saying, go back. Wake up. Strengthen what's left. The roots, what you guys started. There have been such great men and women of God who have come out of these denominations Great teachers, great revivals have come out of these churches. But they fizzled out and they became religious organizations. They've moved away from the truth of God's word and accepted liberal man-made views. A few years ago I went round and round with a guy across the town. He's got one of the biggest, he's retired now, he had one of the biggest churches, denominational churches, where all the, the vice presidents and all the business and Rotary and all those top guys all hung out and went. And they were trying to approve same-sex marriage. And he said, as Christians, we support same-sex marriage, we support homosexuality. We don't believe in the archaic, outdated views of the Old Testament. We don't follow that. God's word is flawless. It's not outdated. He said we believe in a new revelation of God. God is giving new revelations. I'm sorry, I got one Bible. Until he returns again, and until he walks amongst us again and issues another one, I have to go with this one. I can't question whether or not it's right or wrong, because if I question that, if, that, that there's mistakes in God's word, that is, then I have to question all of God's word. I can't just say there's a mistake here. Well, how do I know there's not a mistake there? How do I know it's turned the other cheek? Maybe it's popped the guy in the eye. Maybe the guy made a mistake. Maybe somebody hit him. He didn't like it. But the Bible says that God's word is flawless. That he is the word. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1, 14. And the Word made it, Word became flesh and made His dwelling amongst us. To know the Bible is to know Jesus. To know Jesus is to know His Bible. So I begin to contradict that. I got a real problem because two things. A, I got to question everything in the Word of God. B, I got to question God Himself. If this super all-powerful, knowing, great God, creator of the universe, can't keep a book intact, then we got some problems. Amen? He ain't as great and holy as I think. He's a fallible God who makes mistakes. Shoot. You know, I really wanted, you know, this guy to do it, but he wasn't around. I had Carlos do it. He made a couple of things. He added a few things. I can't help it. Carlos kind of added some things I didn't have him do, but that's all I had at the time. You know what I mean? Hey, work with me here. I'm God. Right? We got problems. We might as well listen to Isaac the milk cow thief, right? <laughs> Maybe he's got a better story. If that's the God we serve, we're in trouble. God's word is what keeps you from following me as a cult leader. It keeps you from getting demands and rule of me as your pastor because you can check me via God's word and you can say, Pastor Tom, how can you say that? Well, I'm telling you, bro, divorce your wife. Get rid of her. Shouldn't have got her in the first place. Drop her now. Can you show me that biblically? No, but I don't like her. <laughs> Pastor Tom, the Bible, Pastor Tom. Mmm, Pastor Tom sounded real good right now. Maybe the Bible's flawed. How convenient. If I like my sin more than I hate it, then I find that the Bible has error. Amen? I can begin to manipulate and change it. But if I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind... I'll like the things that I don't like about it. Amen? I'll eat the sashimi even if I don't want to. Amen? Because I love him more than myself. I trust him more than myself. I realize I'm a sinner. And that the Bible says some things that are going to hurt. And gonna, oh man, i got to work on that one. I realize that the word of God is true. It's living and it's active. How do I know? Because when I read it, I'm like, oh man. Love your enemies. I don't want to love my enemies. Forgive. I don't want to forgive. I want to smack. That makes me feel better. Amen? Love your enemies. No. Hit your enemies. No. I guess I'm a sinner because I don't want to love them. Amen? I need your help, Jesus. Help me because your word says you'll help me. The word of God is what it's about. The word of man is sketchy at best. Either I'm studying and teaching and being led by the Spirit or I'm not. And if, and if I'm not, you need to get out. Bolt quickly. Jesus said this. I'm wrapping it up here. Remember therefore how you have received. Remember what your forefathers did. Remember why you're a Methodist. Because you methodically went through the Word of God. Remember why you're a Presbyterian. So that the presbytery, the leaders, the elders could, could dictate one man didn't get in control. Remember why you're a Puritan because you want that pure word. You wanted to be pure. Remember why you guys broke away a Lutheran because Martin Luther wanted to get the word of God back. He wanted to have worship. Remember why you guys started. Remember these great men and women of God who gave their lives, who broke away to give you the freedom and go back. Go back. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast. Get right. If not, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I come. Jesus warned us. Watch therefore. You do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of God is coming at an hour that you do not expect. In other words, live your faith every day, all day, because he may come back at any time. Or you may go visit him at any time. Don't be caught sleeping. Have a daily faith. Listen, we weren't appointed to suffer the wrath of God. 
we were not appointed to suffer the wrath of God, but to walk with Him in eternity, but to live a faith with Him and be with Him for eternity. Hell was not made for you and I. It was made for the fallen angels and Satan. We were made for eternity. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day, judgment day, should overtake you as a thief. You all sons uh, of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love and a helmet uh, of the hope of salvation, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, he appointed us to live our faith. He appointed us to, to, to have a faith. To not go through the motions of our faith. To not put on a show. To not just sing along to a pop, pop tune up here. To not just go to the Bible studies and go through the motions. And to, and to just, you know... Feel good about yourself. Well, I went to church Sunday. You do nothing the rest of the week. Oh, I went to Bible study on Tuesday and I'm going to go Sunday. And you do, do nothing. Maybe you read a, a little daily bread. Maybe you shoot up a quick shopping list prayer. But to live your faith because you have the freedom to live your faith. Because you have the word right here. Because you have the opportunity to, 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 to help and bless others in the name of Jesus so you too can set them free. We, we have the opportunity to remember where we came from and how miserable it was. It's not about us getting to heaven. That was sealed at the cross the minute we accepted him. But it's about the other people out there who are going to hell because they have been deceived. Because the enemy's out there saying these things and, and tell them that they're stupid and they're dumb and nobody loves them and they might as well go do this and they might as well go that they might as well just kill themselves and every day he's ruining lives he's ruining marriages he's ruining families workplaces people are hooked up on drugs and pornography and alcohol and violence and anger and depression and we know the truth and we've been set free and we need to share the truth with them in love. That they might know the truth and they might be set free via the word of God. Well, my pastor always says, well, I don't care what your pastor says. What does Jesus say? I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're going through. You know what? I gave my heart to Jesus. Things changed. Let me pray for you. Is there something I can pray for you? Hey, Easter's coming up. Why don't you come with me and hear the message of the cross? Hey, we're going to meet down at Starbucks. Isaac's going to buy you a frappa latte chino. He's going to drink it like this with his pinky up in the air. But don't mind that because he likes Jesus. He loves Jesus. And he's going to share what God did in his life. These are regular people. We're all regular people. We're just loving the Lord. We're doing it together. Come on and join. Experience what I have. If they say, get lost, too bad, nothing, nothing lost. You're not invited to the Super Bowl party, nothing lost. Keep praying, they'll bring you someone out. But we can't pretend to be Christian. Can't pretend. We got to live it because he sees and he knows. Doesn't matter what you say to me. Doesn't matter if you sit in the front row, get on your knees, raise your hands, wear the t-shirt, play the CD, doesn't matter. This is what matters. And he sees. Don't let it flicker out. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. Get the fire going again. Because our faith is an exciting faith. It's a good faith. It's a great faith. And we get to share it. The world right now is watching the Bible miniseries. The world's going to watch Jesus of Nazareth on TV. The world's going to look to the church during Easter. And we get to say, here's the real meaning of the cross. He loved you. He gave his life for you so you could live and be with him eternity. And he's going to forgive you and comfort you and bless you. No, you're not going to have a perfect life, but you're going to have a life where you can walk with Christ. He's going to get you through all things. And you'll live in peace. Peace. A great thing. But we got to live it. That's what he was saying to this church right here. Strength and what's left. 
Oh yeah, there's still good people in these churches. There's still good, great, godly people doing good, great, godly things in these churches. But the hierarchy and structure is already set. The councils have already spoken. The meetings have already taken place and they're already set. But as for us, we can change at any moment. If we haven't been, we need to. If we are, we need more. Light a fire down in my soul, Lord, that I can't contain, I can't control. That's a scary prayer. That is one scary prayer. You're going to turn into a Jesus freak, amen? Oh my God, I was at church the other day. I saw Isaac the Milk Cow Thief. By the way, Isaac won first round in his MMA this week. It was a great fight. Isaac was down and losing. He was on the ground. He was right here by the cage. I went up to the cage and said, Isaac, this is the guy that said you were the milk healthy. Boom, done. Over. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that. The guy made a mistake. Isaac took him down, was pounding him. The guy made a mistake, turned his back on Isaac, and it was done. I don't condone violence, but that was a good win. Amen? <laughs> For five gold coins, I will forgive you of that. <laughs> hey, we got an awesome God. He loves us so much. He wants to do great things in us and through us, truly. You. You. Me. He wants to do great things, really. We got to believe that prayer. A lot of fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. And let that be our prayer. Let that be our prayer. Watch what he will do at Breath of Life. Watch what he will do in your life. You'll be blessed. And you'll bless many other people. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you. Because you're so wonderful in spite of us. In spite of all that we do and have done. You forgive us. You love us, Lord. You saved us. Cost us nothing, Father. Simply by your grace. By your great and wonderful love for us. So, Father, let us not let the flame go out. Let us not get into the routine or the ritual, but let us get excited about our faith. Live our faith each day. Find reasons and ways, Father, to share about you, Lord. Get into your word, Father. Pray, worship, whatever it is, Father. But light us back on fire, Lord. Get us excited. So, Lord, we love you so much. We praise you. We pray for Easter. Lord, that you would just open the doors for a Tuesday on the radio, that the word would get out, these, these flyers would get out, Father, the people would come to hear the gospel message, Lord, and that we'd all have to stand up and give our seats out to somebody else. Lord, bless that time, Lord, let a lot of people come down, let us have a great time of prayer and worship Saturday night, Father, fellowship, Lord. Father, we want to honor you, we want to bless you, Father. So thank you, Lord, you're an awesome, wonderful God. We lift it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.